Hi, this is Emily Iannelli, and uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about uh, prospects of having uh, the male-to-female transgender surgery. So I, I have a few things outstanding as to what's needed before they can go ahead and give me a concrete uh, surgical date. The first thing I'm going to need is uh, a letter from my therapist. I already have a letter in place from my psychiatrist and my endocrinologist uh, affiliated with Mount Sinai uh, in uh, New York City. I go to the Mount Sinai Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery. And I've been going there now for approximately three years. Uh, I started my transition now seven years ago. I went back in uh, March of 2012. And I spoke to the, the doctor. And... Um, she was kind of surprised that I wanted to transition to become a woman. So when she saw me, I was wearing a suit and tie with a jacket, what uh, a man would normally wear, a business suit, uh, because I didn't really know how to dress, and I wasn't even able to go out in public because I had a short haircut. I look like a boy, and I uh, obviously wouldn't feel comfortable going out in public looking the way I did and uh, dressing in women's clothing. It wasn't, you know, the smart thing to do. And then uh, when she told me to, uh, you know, dress down because she needed to take vital steps, so when I took off my jacket and my shirt, uh, she saw I was wearing a dress underneath. And then she said, okay, I understand. Uh, she said, so you're still in the closet? And I said, yes. So when I told her I wanted to start on hormones, she said, if in three months I'm still desiring to become female, that she would start me on the hormones traditionally used by women who go through menopause and also for transgender women so they can obtain uh, se some sexual characteristics uh, for a female. So uh, after three months, I, I went there in March of 2012. And then uh, when June came around, which was three months, as she promised, uh, I would start on the hormones. So she had scheduled me for June, and uh, she read me the riot act. Uh, like what's gonna, what you may expect to happen. And, uh, you know, she informed me of the dangers, like with blood clots and things like that. So I said that I am serious about transitioning. And then I went through the whole story that I started uh, questioning uh, my uh, gender when I was as young as three years old. And then when I was six. I was introduced to the idea of having surgery. So I would say at age 16, that was when I started wanting to have the gender change surgery to become female. And uh, I told her, and, you know, when I told her all that, and she had promised me in three months and she saw that I was very willing to go forward with it. So as she promised, she started me on uh, HRT, specifically for male to female transgender. 
so I, 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 she prescribed me uh, estradiol, which is a form of estrogen. I estradiol is the generic for estrace, uh, which is estrogen, and also she prescribed me on spironolactone, which is a diuretic, but in male to female transgender patients, it also serves as a anti-testosterone uh, drug or a testosterone suppressant. So it would uh, pretty much uh, shut off the generating of the testosterone. So essentially it was a chemical castration. And uh, I started to exhibit over about a year and uh, maybe even as close, maybe like a year and a half when I started to notice that I was actually developing female uh, sex, sex characteristics. Like I started having breast development. My skin was like baby soft. Uh, I started to see like my body fat uh, was starting to dis redistribute itself as a result of the hormone usage and I started to exhibit more emotion whereas before I was pretty stone cold I didn't express emotion really and now I find myself getting all choked up crying and I didn't cry much as a guy so it was kind of refreshing to be able to express emotion. Uh, I think uh, men are stereotyped to not really show emotion and not to be in touch with their feelings because that, according to society, is more, f you know, for female. And I'm not, you know, trying to criticize anybody, but even growing up, I was discouraged by my dad from showing emotion, from crying, and even being able to express uh, sentiments like I love you. I mean, my dad never said that to me. He was a good father, but he could never bring himself to say I love you to me because I was a male. And, uh, you know, he, but he, he would say it to my two sisters. So I kind of felt like a little bit, uh, you know, questioning why he felt like he couldn't say that to me. Uh, but I just, you know, let it go by. I really didn't pursue asking him. I just figured that's the way it is. And, I'm, you know, no matter what I say or do, it's probably never going to change. So I was able to go on without, you know, questioning that. I also noticed in addition to the softer skin, the breast development, the redistribution, redistribution of fat, and uh, more emotion that is typically expressed by a woman, more crying, and uh, what else did I notice? Uh, oh yeah, well, I mentioned this already, but my skin became very soft, even all, not just my face, but also my legs, my arms, it's soft to the touch. The only thing that hormones won't do for male to female is change your voice to a more feminine voice. You have to take voice lessons or in conjunction with voice lessons, have vocal cord surgery, which I did. But unfortunately, I didn't really see much change in my voice. Um, but it was a successful surgery. However, I guess for some, it just doesn't, uh, uh, you know, it, it res the results are different from, for each transgender woman. Uh, also, well, this is kind of funny. 
Before I even started my transition, I looked like a typical guy. You know, I had the the mustache, which I hate. I hated that because when I used to shave, I'd cut my skin to shreds. I had such sensitive skin and I would bleed and it was such a pain because I'd have these tissues all over my uh, upper lip and down here because I had blood all over. It was really terrible. So um, once I started on hormones and my skin softened and I did electrolysis, I didn't have the hair like I used to around here on the sides of my face. But this, I still had problems with. And that's why I had to do electrolysis. Unfortunately, it was on and off, so it wasn't consistent. I mean, I heard stories of male to female patients doing like four, maybe five years of straight electrolysis to remove all the hair by taking out the roots and killing them with the zapper. And I've been doing electrolysis on and off since uh, I would say I was still working and I was working seven years ago and eight years ago. Yeah, I would say eight years ago because uh, that's when I really started my male to female transition and I wanted to make sure I was covering all my bases and one of the significant aspects in transitioning from male to female is to try to get at all the hair on your face especially the really hard part of the upper lip and the lower lip because you know that will generally grow where you have mustache growth which is a pain and before I got all this smooth, I used to have like a shadow, a five o'clock shadow. So, you know, typical of men or males. So, you know, I had gotten through that. And also, I remember, you know, thinking to myself before I started my transition, uh, seeing myself in the mirror and questioning how I'm ever going to pass as a female. You know, because I had this very masculine-looking face. All my mannerisms was masculine, even though I wanted to be more feminine. But I was afraid if I exaggerated that, uh, it would be quite obvious and people would make fun of me. So I didn't want to get bullied. I didn't want to get made fun of. So I just didn't display any sense that I was feminine or transgender so I wasn't you know I, I wasn't teased nobody said you you know you are uh, you want to be a girl nobody ever said that and the only way I could get in touch with my femininity though I never advertised it to anybody was to wear women's clothes but underneath my male attire so when i used to go to work i was in a professional office i worked in the accounting field as a cpa so i would basically have a suit and tie so um it was better in the winter months because you're supposed to layer anyway so i would have like a dress underneath that i could fit putting the suit on without really drawing attention but the one thing I couldn't do was take off my jacket because I was afraid if I did they could see the dress through my uh, work shirt so I didn't want to take that risk and uh, you know I was subject to jokes like oh you never take your jacket off even in the summertime you know and I kind of wanted to uh, distract them from going into that so you know I managed you know and I didn't have to come clean or anything uh, and then another aspect of my concern f as to passing as a female was I had a very masculine looking face 
where you could see, and I even had a prominent Adam's apple. So, you know, I'm thinking to myself, look, I, I'm going to be going on hormones, but there's no way it's going to change my facial appearance. In no way it's going to reduce my Adam's apple. And it wasn't going to change my, my, I mean, my voice I didn't think was going to change, which it hasn't really. I mean, my voice may be somewhat different, but, you know, they never tweaked it to be uh, more feminine sounding. And I still get misgendered on phone calls. And I get so frustrated, but I realize how will they, would they know, especially because I didn't even change my name legally. So on all my records... Uh, it's Edward, and my gender marker is male, with the exception of my driver's license for New York State and my passport. Those were the two things where I had my gender marker designated as female. So if you were to look at my license, it would say F, as opposed to M, which was the majority of my of all my driver's licenses over the years when I first started driving at 18 up until I was like uh, well I was like between 50 and 51 when I started my transition so I would say uh, when I was 55 or 56 when I had my uh, gender marker changed on my license and passport and that also required a letter from the doctor, a letter from the therapist saying that you identify as a woman. So I was able to obtain those letters because I'm under uh, a psychiatric care. I, you know, seeing a psychiatrist, even though, you know, uh, I I got I had to go from one psychiatrist to another as it was rotating. And my therapist also changed. Um, but with the psychiatrist and therapist I was seeing at the time, they wrote me letters to, uh, you know, support my claim of identifying as a woman. Um, so when I was concerned about my facial appearance and the prominent Adam's apple, I was worried. I didn't think the hormones would really have any effect. And I didn't realize that it would even affect my breasts um, because I'm happy with the size it is now, which is roughly a 38B. So, you know, when I was, before starting hormones, I thought, you know, my breast development would be like a double A, but it's a B, 38B, so I'm happy with that. But I thought, like other transgender women that I know, uh, opted not only for bottom surgery, for the vaginoplasty, they also uh, felt compelled to do breast augmentation surgery so they would enhance their breast size. And I thought that would be the route I would have to take. So the first two things that I thought I would have to go in that direction was doing facial feminization surgery, uh, a tracheal shave, and uh, the, uh, uh, what, what was I Oh yeah, no, the, the facial feminization surgery, the tracheal shave, oh yeah, and the breast development. I thought I was gonna, you know, have minimal growth uh, so when I went to uh, Dr. Spiegel, because he's really known for uh, facial feminization surgery for transgender women, uh, his offices are up in Massachusetts near Boston. So I remember I set a date uh, maybe a, a few years ago. Uh, no, wait, it couldn't have been a few years because I was on hormones now for roughly seven years. So it was like two years, no, maybe a year into my transition uh, back in uh, uh, 2000, 
13 when I lost my job. Uh, I was only there for seven months, and they were aware that I was transitioning uh, from male to female, and they were okay with it. But before that job, I was working at an engineering firm doing uh, accounting, and I was there roughly three years, and then a CPA firm that I used to work at. But, uh, you know, I presented as male because I hadn't started my transition. But I uh, was under the impression that I wouldn't, uh, you know, encounter that much of a change in my facial features. So when I spoke to Dr. Spiegel at his office, who also works with his wife, as they both specialize in that surgery, and it, it's a surgery that takes place in the office, and there's no need to, which surprised me, but there was no need to spend uh, uh, anything, any, you know, not another day. You did the uh, facial feminization surgery, let's say on a Monday. Uh, you would be, uh, you know, uh, once you awake from the anesthesia wearing off, they would have you resting uh, comfortably, um, but uh, there was no need to spend overnight unless there was a, like a severe complication. So uh, that's what happened. It was only one day, and uh, I think that was in 2016 when I was... Uh, four years into my transition. But the facial feminization surgery that I was concerned about with Dr. Spiegel in Massachusetts, when I was um, a year before the transition, I was curious and, you know, I assumed that his office would accept health insurance. And back then, health insurance was finally covering uh, surgical procedures uh, because the vaginoplasty is no longer considered a cosmetic surgery. If you're declared uh, to have uh, uh, a, di uh, a diagnosis uh, and a doctor's statement supporting that, if you have a diagnosis that it's medically necessary to do the vaginoplasty, then insurance would normally have to cover it. So that was the case. However, facial feminization surgery is not covered under insurance. You actually have to pay out of your pocket. And I believed if you wanted to put it through insurance, you'd still have to pay for the surgery, but they would fill out paperwork along with you, uh, and you would submit it to the insurance company uh, to seek some form of, uh, uh, you know, if it costs whatever, X, then you would get uh, partial coverage. But they didn't consider uh, it medically necessary for the facial feminization. They labeled it as cosmetic. And so when the Dr. Spiegel and his wife went through the itemization of all the, you know, things they would focus on in the surgery. Uh, it was quite a lot of things uh, in addition to the tracheal shave, which they included in the price. They would basically restructure your bone structure uh, and they would do something to make your face look more consistent to that of a female. And when he went through all of that, uh, obviously I was concerned about the price and it was nowhere near what I thought it would be uh, when all was said and done and we looked at the bottom line you're talking about uh, $32,000 uh, so uh, one of his uh, uh, one of the office girls uh, said to me, so when you're ready, 
to go forward with the surgery, please get in touch with our office. Because I said, you know, I needed to discuss it with my family and, uh, you know, then decide uh, logistically when I would do the surgery because I'd have to make the trip up to Boston. And I'm sure there would be some recovery time in the aftermath of the surgery. And uh, I knew, you know, because I didn't know how I would feel after being awoke uh, from the anesthesia wearing off. You know, I, I assumed that I wouldn't be able to drive home all the way from Massachusetts. So obviously I would also have to book a hotel stay for a day maybe. Uh, I don't think it would be more than a day. Uh, but when I saw the price, it was $34,000 in addition to the hotel stay and everything. So I left it that I needed to think about it. And they said, okay. And they gave me a card to reach the office with. Uh, and then they, uh, before I left, they sold me some, like, uh, ointments for your face to make it feel more smoother so I bought that for roughly $250 several of those ointments but with the surgery itself I never called back the office because I couldn't afford it so I was very disappointed and my biggest fear was despite the hormone use that my face was going to look like a male and I you know, I thought that people in public, being in the public eye, I had nightmares that people would look at me and say, oh no, look at that guy, he's a, a dude in a dress. So that was something that really bothered me and I was very concerned about. Concerned enough to I wonder if I should go forward with the hormone use. But little did I know, and uh, my doctor who put me on the hormones, when I told her my intentions before I nixed the idea, uh, she said, well, to be honest with you, with all the male to female transgender patients I've worked with, uh, they were pretty pleased with the results of the hormones. And she said, don't like look in the mirror every day thinking it's gonna change. But gradually, it is going to change, and your face will become more oval, and it will your cheeks would become more puffier, and uh, you would be surprised, because the hormones do work. And as she said, it was really true. Within two years of uh, being on the hormones, my face started to look more and more like a female. So the combination of my hair growth because I never had my hair grow uh, that I, it was never long from I mean the the most was when the Beatles came out initially and they looked like they had uh, you know like uh, I, their hair wasn't long but it was considered long I used to try to have my hair look on that kind of style um but, uh, you know, she said your face will eventually look more feminine. And she was right, because like I said, when I grew my hair down to my shoulders, uh, and I looked in the mirror, I said, oh my God, that's a woman. So I was very pleased. And I'm also, I was very pleased that I didn't have to go f for the, the facial feminization surgery. But I do know some transgender women who did go forward with it, and the changes were remarkable. But they look really masculine, and when you looked at the after, it was like two different people, where they were extremely feminine, and I was very impressed. And I, the reason why I was considering him also was even before I met him, I would look at his gallery of before and afters, on his website and I even googled uh, you know him and saw these remarkable changes with the uh, before and after look like two different people and the after really look like a woman you know in mo mo most cases that I saw uh, but 
the hormones worked after two years I started to see my face become more feminine and then with the long hair the combination really uh, accentuated the femininity and then I got my hair colored blonde so that added another dimension uh, to my male to female transgender with highlights which I never did when I was a guy um, so that was something that I was grateful for and I as obviously my doctor was right because she's an expert um, and then I uh, started to realize that I didn't even need to do breast augmentation surgery because I was quite satisfied with uh, my breast development as a 38B. Uh, it hasn't gone beyond that, but 38B is fine for me because I'm petite. I'm five foot four, but my weight is a problem, and I need to make sure I get my weight down at least 20 to 25 pounds um, because you know they don't want excessive weight. Uh, so I'm um, trying to get down to roughly 150 pounds. Uh, even if ideally I would even like to get down to like 130 pounds, but there's no way I'm going to lose between 40 and 50 pounds. So I'm just, I'd be satisfied if I lost half of that, let's say 25 pounds, uh, which would bring me down to 150 uh, then I'd be okay with that. Um, and also, I noticed, too, uh, in addition to my face and my uh, skin, basically all over my body, that it really softened my skin. And uh, uh, the body fat, it started to redistribute. I guess here, too, that's part of it. But all over, like in the hips, the and my legs, my thighs, my arm, I mean, everything was so smooth, like a baby soft. So I was pleased there. And then any other developments noticeable? Well, I also noticed that I became a lot more emotional. Uh, and I started... Uh, you know, feeling much more content. But I still had gender dysphoria, and it was pretty bad. And I also had depression. Uh, and I also had, uh, you know, wearing that I need to, as soon as possible, have uh, the gender change surgery from male to female, which incorporates where your male genitalia is uh, shaped into more like uh, uh, they would work with that and they would create a, a vagina, a clitoris, and a labia uh, with regard to that. But they would take uh, the testicles, they would remove completely. So all you would have to work with would be the shaft of your penis and they would uh, construct that uh, into a vagina and my surgeon uh, said, asked me like how much depth, depth I would like uh, assuming that I would have penetrative sex obviously with a man and I said you know you 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 know better than I so he threw out uh, five inches so to me, five inches seems reasonable. And he then said, that's really the most depth that normal, typical women have with respect to their vagina. So, you know, I, I, that made me feel like that would be the direction to go. You know, and uh, to this date now, I'm 58, I've been trying to do the surgery as early as 2015 and now we're in 2019 so uh four surgeries four surgery dates came and went 
and due to various reasons, uh, they were postponed. And in one instance, I even detransitioned because I felt guilty that it was affecting my son and my family. But for those two weeks that I detransitioned and then I got my hair cut short and dyed brown from my blonde, which I love, uh, I was never so depressed. I was devastated. And then I realized I made a big mistake. Uh, and people said, what are you, detransitioning? So I uh, really got very depressed. And I was wearing uh, pants and these baggy shirts to cover my breast development. Uh, but I was feeling really bad, awful, like uh, very upset what I did uh, because I wasn't being true to who I feel I am as a woman. So with that said, after two weeks and being miserable, I, and I talked to my psychiatrist about it, I, I just said, yeah, I'm going back to where I'm transitioning to become a woman, and I haven't turned back since. Uh, and I'm happy because my hair is starting to grow. Uh, it's going to take a while to get back down to my shoulders, but it is growing, and I have enough hair where I could put hair bows in my hair, and if I put on a pretty dress like this, I have a hair bow, I have blonde hair, and I have a soft face, I look feminine, I don't get misgendered. You know, when I got the short haircut, you know, I couldn't even wear dresses anymore, I just felt like I would stick out like a sore thumb, having like a short hair, typical style of a boy or male, man, a man, uh, male. Uh, so I didn't go out in public. It was like when I first started transitioning, I wouldn't go out uh, in public dressed like a woman because I didn't really, uh, I wasn't really even close to being uh, feminine. So it was awful. I felt like I was going back in time. And it affected me psychologically and mentally. So now I'm much happier. My hair is growing long. I'm able to wear dresses again. I ditched the, the men's clothes. And uh, I'm very happy. So now, after four attempts to have the male to female transgender bottom surgery, I booked again with my surgeon who asked me the depth I want for my vagina. And uh, he's willing to work with me despite the fact that I had to like uh, lose uh, four dates for the opportunity to do the surgery. For male to female bottom surgery, like I said, it's a vaginoplasty, which includes the creation from the male organ of vagina, uh, a clitoris, and the labia, labia. And they also indicated that when you're having sex, penetrative sex with a man, that you would reach, you would experience having an orgasm, uh, just like typical women do in their sexual relations with men. So that sounded good to me. So now we're in the process of scheduling a date. The only thing really that I need is a letter from my therapist, since I'm gonna have for my uh, psychiatrist and my uh, endocrinologist. Uh, so, um, I, I have to get a letter from my therapist who's not affiliated with Mount Sinai. And once I have that, then uh, they could work up a date. But in addition to that, I have to do continued electrolysis or laser down by my uh, private parts, uh, which sounds very painful, but they numb that area with a needle. Uh, so you really don't feel it. The numbing effect really works. Uh, and uh, if I could do my face with the electrolysis, I started to figure out, I, could, I figured that I could do my uh, 
removal of the hair uh, even in my private area. Uh, the reason why they want you to get virtually all that hair removed is because when they construct the vagina, they don't want hair within the canal. Uh, that's a bad thing and they don't want that. So that's why I need to also establish getting that done. And I, you know, it's still a lot of ifs because that's a main thing. The other thing, aside from all the letters, is the uh, making sure that insurance will cover it. They have to proper, properly describe the, the surgery and, you know, what it's all about with all of the codes properly reflected for that typical vaginoplasty uh, orchiectomy surgery. Uh, and then uh, a date will be uh, determined once you can establish that you have a good aftercare program, which uh, my social worker and uh, the surgeon who's going to do the surgery uh, uh, the recovery time for male to female uh, transgender surgery for the vaginoplasty uh, roughly is two to three months recovery where you can't do much of anything uh, other than being in an upward position, sleeping, you know, or resting. And you, you can watch TV as long as you're staying in that kind of position. And then after the surgery, like a week or so after, you have to, I have to go. Uh, once they remove the catheter and the packing, I would have to go for a follow-up, roughly for a week at a time for the next month or two. Uh, and they also wanted me to have reliable transportation because I wouldn't be able to drive. And a reliable... Uh, aftercare uh, uh, set up. Uh, so now I uh, have uh, one of my friends who's uh, female to male, another one of my friends who's male to female but still looks like a guy, like I did in the very beginning. Uh, uh, my neighbor who can give me a, a day or two a week for like the next two to three months. And each of the other, my transgender friends, same thing, one day a week. And then my female to male friend said he can come to pick me up uh, after I'm released from the hospital. Uh, because you have to have a concrete plan in place for a transportation home. And uh, uh, once I have that all verified, and I provided this already to the social worker, at Mount Sinai, so I got a call today from her, and she said that uh, everything's looking good, uh, provided all of what I said regarding my aftercare is true. Uh, the only thing I told her was, you know, I can't say you come one day a week without knowing the definite date uh, proposed for the surgery. So after that's determined, then I can schedule days with my friends because they also would have to work it around their uh, working schedules, you know, because they have a life too. And I don't want them to all of a sudden stop it just for me. But they insisted that they could do a day. And then I have my mother-in-law who would help me on the weekends. And uh, my son said I could use his room for privacy because I'm also going to have to use a dilator, I guess consistent to a vibrator that a woman uses to, you know, uh, and, you know, simulate uh, sex with a man because the vibrator would be shaped in the form of a penis, just like the uh, dilating uh, instruments, uh, they would also be in the form of a male penis. And that kind of freaks me out a little bit because I can't even envision a man, uh, uh, you know, 
that organ uh, being used to uh, keep my vagina opened. But I've come to uh, realize that I need to do that. Otherwise, you run the risk that your vagina will close up because it was told to me that your body treats uh, that over time as a wound and it's trying to heal it. Uh, and part of it would be that it would start to close up. So basically, I'm going to have to dilate for the rest of my life. And then also, I'm going to have the catheter hooked up until I can start going uh, to the bathroom like a typical woman does. You know, I sit on the, the uh, toilet since I started my transition, even before uh, I don't stand up, you know, and it's been a long time, at least 10 years maybe, roughly. Uh, so, you know, obviously once I have the surgery and the catheter is removed, I'm going to be peeing like a typical girl or woman does. Uh, because obviously I won't have the same organ uh, like I had when I was male. Now my uh, body would resemble more uh, feminine, uh, total feminization, which I've wanted for the longest time. I used to sleep at night, and I said I want complete and total feminization. No hint of being male or masculine in any way. And to be honest, growing up, even before I transitioned, I never felt masculine. But I would uh, kind of pretend that I was, uh, so I wouldn't send off any signals that I'm really a very feminine, or they would call effeminate, an effeminate, uh, which is like a guy who is extremely feminine like a woman is. Um, so uh, I'm just waiting on a date uh, and also insurance approval. Once all that's in place, then I can go forward with the surgery once the date is determined. And then uh, I would have to uh, uh, you know, go through the process with the healing uh, and also the surgery um, would be roughly a six-hour surgery. So I was concerned, like, I don't want to be on the operating table and the anesthesia wears off and I wake up during the surgery. That would be my ultimate nightmare. Uh, so the surgeon uh, said, no, you don't have to worry about that. You know, they've been doing these surgeries for a long time, all different body shapes and body weights. So they said, I don't need to worry about that uh, because they have the continuous flow of the anesthesia. So you're asleep for the whole procedure. Um, and <coughs> after the surgery, it would require three to four days in the hospital recovering. Plus they would pack uh, in the area where they had to uh, create the vagina, that would be all packed uh, and you'd go home. But then when you go back in a week uh, following the surgery, actually following the release date, which is four days after the surgery. So I would have to come a week after that when I was released. And uh, I'm, you know, I have some mixed feelings about the surgery. I have lots of problems worrying about my son because he's autistic. And uh, that uh, I feel like I'm being selfish, you know, because in reality, your kids are supposed to come first. So I don't want to have that uh, interfere with my need to make sure my son uh, gets to his appointments with the doctors uh, and also that he gets to his day program. 
But the problem is I can't drive for at least two months following the surgery. And uh, you know, that's the concerns I have. But And I'm also concerned like uh, how I'm going to adjust now with a vagina since it's been over 50 years that I had male uh, anatomy. And now all of a sudden I have more of a female anatomy consistent to a woman. Uh, and then uh, trying to get uh, used to the idea that I most likely will now be attracted to men and wanting to engage in uh, sex with men. Uh, so that also enters into my mind, you know, but I uh, am married, so I would never do anything to jeopardize that. However, I haven't had sexual con... Uh, uh, I haven't had uh, surgery... I mean, uh, uh, sexual... Uh, 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 I haven't had sex in, like... Uh, 21 years, I only had it a few times in, uh, you know, uh, uh, wanting to have a child. Uh, and then once my son was born uh, a few months prior, we never had sex after that. And one of the reasons I get my wife was concerned uh, that uh, I was getting too old and she was concerned about the possibility of autism and uh, when she noticed my son when he was an infant because I was working so I couldn't I couldn't you know pick up on that but my wife was home with the Matthew and she started to realize that Matthew wasn't making eye contact he wasn't verbalizing uh, he would uh, uh, exhibit a ritualistic type of behavior. So after a while, she said, I think Matthew needs to be uh, evaluated because of all of these things that I'm seeing. And once she told me that, I said, yeah, we better check this out. But I didn't have a clue what it could be. And then Maria had an inkling that it might be autism. And... Uh, she was right when he got the uh, diagnosis uh they said that he was autistic and from that point on uh maria and i just stopped having sex she just didn't want to take the chance because i was now 40 years old and they say when a man in the relationship uh is sexually uh you know functioning sexually uh that uh, the age could become a factor in a uh, child becoming autistic. So we both got uh, spooked about that. Even though I wanted to have another child, wishing that we would have a little daughter in addition to Matthew. But that wasn't meant to be. And then I feel sad and sorry because Matthew says, I wish I had a brother or a sister. I don't like being an only child. And, you know, that kind of upsets me. Uh, not because of him, but understanding his disappointment. And, you know, saying, I, don't, I wish I wasn't an only child. Uh, so that made me feel pretty guilty. But I figure now, if if I don't do the surgery now... Uh, when I have the big possibility, and especially in the wake of four attempts that never happened, uh, this is do or die for me. If I don't do it, I'm not going to do it. So if I don't do it, you know, within this time, this year, I'm approaching 60. So if it doesn't happen towards the end of my 50s, then I'm just not going to pursue the surgery because I can't keep getting my hopes up and then to have them crushing down because the surgery has to be postponed or rescheduled. Uh, so, you know, this is it. If I don't do it now, I'm not going to do it. I figure, you know, if I live 51 years as a guy with uh, genitalia consistent with a male, 
uh, I, what's another 10 years, you know? So, uh, you know, I want to have the opportunity to be a full-fledged female, uh, including the vagina surgery, vaginoplasty. So that's where I stand right now. I'm hoping, I'm hoping soon I'll know a date. I'm hoping that the insurance will come through and cover it. I'm hoping that uh, everything works out health-wise and also losing the amount of weight that I need as a target weight. And so I'm hoping that all of that will work in my favor. So then the surgeon and his team of surgeons can go forward and I can be rest assured that I would then go into the surgery. Uh, I'd be going in as a male and then I'd be waking up as a female. Uh, so the only other thing that I'm concerned about is the pain that I'll be in uh, following the surgery because I have a friend who lives in the UK and she's 24 and she's ex she's uh, experiencing extreme pain to the point where she's been sending me messages saying I really shouldn't go through with the surgery because I'm nearing 60 you know and she's 24 and she's feeling this pain which is lasting for now four days post surgery now I know for a fact that you're going to experience some pain after the surgery and that they're going to give you a painkiller medication so my uh, uh, innocence uh, or um, uh, you know my uh, naivete uh, is making me think like the surgery will not result in a great amount of pain, especially when you put on the pain medication. But, you know, seeing what's going on with my friend in the UK, and she's only 24, and she's trying to convince me that I'm too old to go through this kind of surgery, and she's doing it with genuine concern. So that's kind of freaking me out a little bit. But ideally, I've been wanting this since I was 16. And then to all of a sudden walk away from it permanently, you know, I would have regrets, you know. I would have curiosity. You know, if I went through the surgery, I'd be so much more happier. Plus, generally, the gender dysphoria would go away. The one thing that I would do, though, that a lot of transgender women don't do is I would still identify, even though now I have a vagina and that I can have sex with men and all that, the one thing is I will never abandon the fact that I'm male to female transgender, regardless of the surgery. And then, obviously, once you have the surgery, you're considered more of a male to female transsexual rather than male to female transgender. But whatever the label may be, uh, I'm still going to identify as uh, transgender and not as a woman uh, because technically I'm not, even though I may look like one and I'll have a vagina now, uh, but genetically I'm male. I, if I was younger, like my friend in the UK, it wouldn't result in me having a monthly period. Uh, because the surgery would not do, and obviously I wouldn't experience pregnancy. Uh, uh, it's like, you know, uh, they have like a, a special way of doing the pregnancy where it's outside of the uterus, which you need if you're going to have typical uh, surgery, a woman uh, giving birth. Uh, but men don't have a uterus. And uh, it hasn't been uh, successful in transplanting a uterus into a male to female patient. I think on maybe a, a, a f like maybe you can count it on one hand uh, where all of them were unsuccessful. And in fact, they made a movie called The Danish Girl, where according to the movie, 
uh, sh they were trying to also give her, in addition to the typical male to female sur uh, a surgery, to uh, uh, incorporate a uterus transplant. But unfortunately, that resulted in uh, the death of the woman. I think her name was Lily Elba. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, she died. Um, but I guess I'm kind of looking forward to the surgery, you know, and then to be able to see my vagina and then obviously doing what the trans women have to do with dilating and the dilating you have to do for the rest of your life. Uh, but you do not now have to take... Uh, uh, spironolactone because once they remove your testicles and create the vagina uh, there's no need because there will be absolutely no uh, production of testosterone uh, essentially your your body will be completely feminized uh, inclusive of the vaginoplasty uh, and the orchiectomy which is the removal of the testicles uh, obviously, I've been uh, rendered uh, 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 in, uh, uh, where you can't have uh, sexual relations with a woman. For instance, if I, in theory, wanted to masturbate uh, when I was younger, I would have an, uh, body fluids, uh, you know, and I'd have that climax feeling. But now, if I did that, you wouldn't have any discharge. It would be so weird, weird because you would still climax, but nothing coming. Uh, no fluid, no semen, nothing. Uh, so um, that's a little weird, too. Plus, I have no sex drive since I've been on hormones. And it is technically a chemical castration. Um, so if I go through with the surgery, hoping I will, um, you know, I'll provide updates and I'll even provide updates leading up to the surgery. Um, but I think, uh, you know, if everything falls into place, I'm hopefully going to have surgery before the end of 2019. Uh, and that's all I can hope for in addition to making sure Matthew will be okay. Um, and then making sure that I get the proper care, uh, aftercare, and that I keep dilating every day uh, for at least 20 minutes, three times a day, which would translate into an hour of dilating. And in the beginning, let's face it, it's going to be very painful. Because it's going to be the first time that you're sticking something in that uh, sensitive area. And then also you're going to need to start going, oh, well, I'll have to uh, uh, get uh, a select a gynecologist. Um, because I'm going to have, you know, especially if I'm sexually active with men, I will need uh, to uh, seek a gynecologist to go to just like any other woman does. And I would also need to like make sure my vagina is clean, uh, especially uh, after having sex with men uh, and uh, douching and doing all that feminine hygiene stuff. Uh, I won't need a tampon though. Uh, but, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, I'll be really a woman, uh, which is something I've been wanting for since childhood. And I will be ecstatic. It will be a surreal experience. You know, my dream is that when I go into the surgery, I'm considered a man. But when I come out of the surgery, my fantasy is where the surgeon and the nurses say, congratulations, you're a woman now. Uh, hoping that I will now be a woman. So that's about all I have to say today. Um, and I will do more videos. 
and uh, you know, I try to help others, especially in the wake of the surgery. Um, and uh, that's about it. And I will, you know, do follow up videos as well, leading up to the surgery and post surgery. And when I come out of the operating room and they revive me, I will now know what it's like to be a post-op transgender woman. Because right now, I'm a pre-op transgender woman. And I want to cross the other side of the fence to now be a post-op transgender woman or transsexual woman. Uh, and I think that would be fantastic. And then I can join the club of other male to female transgender women who have had the surgery and now are living as women. Uh, and the funny thing is, a lot of them initially said they would never have sex with a man. And of the four transgender women I know, only one stuck by her wife. Whereas the other ones unfortunately got divorced. You know, they don't see their kids. And uh, they're now having sex with men. Whereas before surgery, they said they're never going to have sex with a man. They're not interested. They're not attracted. So it's funny how the surgery, you know, kind of changes your mind. Especially when you're still taking the female hormones. So that's kind of a weird thing that I'm thinking about also. Because realistically, I'm not even envisioning even having the desire to have sex with men but if it does happen then so be it you know maybe it would be a fun thing because really what's the sense of having a vagina if you're not going to use it uh, in a sexual situation and it just doesn't you can't even compare like if you have a woman uh using some form of uh a device where it seems like she can simulate uh, being the male, uh, but it's just not the same. So I'll see how everything works out, and I'll do follow-up before surgery, leading up to, and after surgery, and the recovery process. So with that said, I'll say goodbye for now, Emily Ionelli, and... Uh, I wish all of you out there, transgender women, transgender men, that you achieve all your goals with your transition. And if it's surgery also that you're looking for, I hope you're able to do the surgeries and that they're successful. So I will say goodbye for now. Emily Ionelli is signing off. Bye. And thank you for watching my YouTube channel. And hopefully subscribing uh, because I'll have more content. In fact, my very last video, I uh, uh, filmed uh, Jimmy Eat World uh, and Third Eye Blind uh, in concert. And I went with one of my transgender friends, a female to male transgender friend. And it's ironic that I have, of all the transgender friends I have, the best friend and the most supportive friend is my female to male uh, transgender friend. Plus, he also advises me as to like accentuating my eyes, uh, 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 makeup, and you know, this is a guy now, but I guess he knows what it's like to be a female and he's offering me some tips and advice and uh, also kind of giving me an idea what uh, sex would be like with a man uh, because he uh, had experienced that. Uh, but now he's only attracted to women. Like I feel I may only be attracted to men now because I'm male to female. And logically you would then be attracted to men and you would be considered heterosexual. But if you uh, kept uh, the relationship with a woman, then you'd be considered a lesbian. And let's face it, I don't think your your wife 
would even want to be referred to as a lesbian. So I guess that comes between marriages. Uh, so, you know, I'm just waiting to see what happens. And if it happens, great. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Uh, I mean, I lived this long as a guy. Uh, even though I'm dressing and presenting as a female, I'll still have the male genitalia. And, you know, I have to just be accustomed to it. But one thing I know is if I still have that as opposed to a vagina, there's no way I'm going to have any desire to be with a man because I still will have the anatomy consistent to a man, even though I present as a woman. Uh, the only way I believe that I would entertain the thought of attraction to men and having sex with men is the vaginoplasty and being successful, because now I'll have a vagina. And ideally, who do you have sex with when you're a woman? A man. So uh, that is a good possibility especially based on what my male-to-female transgender friends have experienced. So I'm approaching the one hour, 15 minute mark, so I think this is a good time to sign off. Uh, all right, bye, and thanks for subscribing and watching my videos. I appreciate it. Uh, Emily Ionelli signing off for now. Bye.